My paranormal experiences happened since childhood. One that I'll always remember happened approximately 15 years ago, not too far from my parents' house. We lived near the trails called the Witch Trails. I went with, at that time period, was my first husband and my pet dog that I always took when I went walking or jogging. It was approximately around seven, eight o'clock that night. And we decided just to go down there because he's never been on a haunted trail. And since it was so close to my parents' house, I figured, you know, just take him down there, show him what the big fuss was about. My father has always felt a presence there even during the day. And at that time, there was nobody living out there. It was just an open field. It wasn't a lot of activity during the day, but at nighttime, it seems like he just did not want to go down there. So we took our flashlights, took my dog, and we just went hiking. And first few miles, it was just, you know, quiet. It wasn't, you know, anything abnormal. But the closer we got to the center of the woods, it started going into silence. And my dog, who normally goes in front of me, like dogs do, they like to go ahead, stay behind. They like to sniff everywhere. She was uh, by my side. My ex-husband at that time was my, like I said, he was my first husband. We were just talking about how quiet it was. I mean, there was no birds. There was nothing, no crickets or anything. And mind you, this was like a um, Indian summer. So you should hear something, even as late in the fall as it was. I started hearing something. And, you know, as a hunter or as a tracker, you know, when you're being followed, you know, when you're being watched. And I stopped dead in place. You know, I didn't want to move one way or the other. And my dog, who was normally a good dog, she would never bark or growl. Her hair on the back of her was standing up and she just did not want to leave my side. And we were hearing things in the tree, the tree that was right beside us. And I stepped back a little bit. Next thing I know, I see a creature that was not a, a squirrel. I mean, this and upper body reminded me almost like a orangutan. It was just that big, but it didn't move like a orangutan. It pretty much ran out from one tree, jumped a pretty good distance to the other tree, and we did not move from that spot. We just looked at that. We didn't know what to say. And I told my ex at that, my first husband, I'm like, we need to go. This is not safe. Something's wrong. And we just saw something that wasn't a cat. It wasn't a raccoon. We don't live too far from an area called Shark Bottoms, where it's known to have sightings of Bigfoot. Matter of fact, a lot of the area around here has Bigfoot um, posters and wood carvings and everything. But you don't hear about devil monkeys out in Tennessee, between middle and west Tennessee. And to see something like that, you just don't forget it. We walk back slowly without turning our backs because we didn't know if it was following us. We didn't know if it was still there. All I know that it was just completely silent. And my dog started running a little bit ahead of us and we started heading back. And when we got close to the road, we finally took a deep breath and realized that that could have killed us. Whatever it was, it was giving us a warning. I have a lot of Native American tribal and we're taught to listen to our intuition, we came close to getting attacked. I don't know if we were near a nesting area. All I know is that the way it moved was not a squirrel. The way it looked almost like a orangutan. And the tail, it was long as its arms. When it leaped, it wasn't a short distance. It was a pretty good distance. It was like a few good feet. I mean, for it to jump that far, it had to be very strong. And then after it left, it was, I don't think it truly left. I think it was watching to see if we would continue on. And we didn't. We turned back around. And now in that spot, people have started uh, moving their homes and everything into those woods. And I I still pray for them because um, that area is not safe. I don't know if there's other nestings. And if there are, they could have a wake-up call. (laughs) And I do not want to wake up like that way. So. That was my experience about 15 years ago, and I'll never forget that. It was something that has been burned into my brain. So when I even look on the TV or YouTube and I see orangutan, you know, it brings me back to that part at night where I still remember that. 
And the thing what gets me is that there's no zoos around us. The closest zoos that we have near where I live or where my parents live is about two and a half, nearly three hours away, both ways. So it's like, there is no way that could have been what I saw. You know, it couldn't have been a orangutan, but whatever I saw, put the fear of God in you. I'll put it that way. I've had other paranormal encounters before that and after, starting from that I can recall was around five. We were living in the um, brick house that my parents had just gotten. And when I was young, I used to hear footsteps above the room. I thought it was my dad, you know, because my dad, he wore military boots and he had just gotten out of the military not too long after. I went and told my mother one day, I'm like asking my mother, I said, is daddy up in the attic? And she's like, no, your dad can't fit in the attic. So she took me to the uh, carport, what used to be the carport and showed me and the opening to the attic, I could fit in there as a five-year-old, but not my dad. My dad was actually one of the people that got me involved in the paranormal. He used to tell us stories about what happened when he was a boy. And it really got me because I didn't know what a ghost was. I didn't know what a spirit was. I didn't know about paranormal. I just, you know, knew that there's some things I could see or feel and other people didn't around me. My dad used to tell us about an um, incident with him when he was a teenager. Him and his dad were um, sitting out on the porch and it was a summer night. They saw something floating towards them. And they went in the house and got their shotguns and started shooting and the guns wouldn't go off. It was like, even after the trigger was pulled, something was preventing the guns going off. And my dad said that you could see the torso. You didn't see a head or arms or anything like that. It was just like a floating torso. So, of course, the next day they took their guns out, the same ones. They didn't touch any of the ammo or anything like that. They put everything like it was. And they were able to fire it, had no problem. So, of course, they moved right after that incident. Even my mother in her country, she used to talk about cryptozoology. But in their culture, they're closer to the paranormal than what we are here in the States, believe it or not. She used to tell me about her brother. They used to go treasure hunting because in Panama, uh, where she's from, they used to have pirate attacks like way, way back when. And there was rumor about hidden treasure. And my uncles, one of them has already passed away. One, um, he's, he's up in years now. But they used to talk about these lights that had no source. I mean, you could look up and you're looking at like fireworks, you know, but they're not fireworks. They were just globes. I know a lot of people have trouble believing that the orbs, but when you see one, you can't mistake it as a bug or anything like that. The paranormal has been around my family for a very long time. Going back to when I was a child, it seems like I would see things or hear things and nobody else would hear it. And I was always told by my parents and teachers that I had a very vivid imagination. I remember one time we went on a field trip to um, Shiloh Park, which is a national park. They also have Indian mounds there. I remember seeing soldiers walking out and I thought it was a reenactment because you know it's a field trip it is a national park people will dress up seeing a cannonball go through somebody and seeing soldiers helping each other out and some of them very wounded as a kid you almost believe okay I, I guess this is part of the act or something things like that would happen it's like going to graveyards I hated it because I would hear the screams or several talking all at once and there's like nobody out there and I'm like okay my mother just telling me that if you hear voices you're going crazy and I'm like okay am I going crazy is this normal I remember a little bit later on we had cocker spaniels that had gotten loose went missing and one of them have gotten shot because you know dogs they like to go to chickens and stuff like that I can remember Every time we lost an animal, they would come in my dreams. And however they died, they showed up. The one that was shot, her name is Peaches. It was about two, three nights later, 
The dream was so real. I mean, I could touch everything. It was so real. I thought it, I was awake. And when she turned her head, I could see where she had gotten shot. And I seen her go away and, and vanish. You know, when somebody in the family passed away, I knew it before they did. Not the people that were passing, but when family would call, it was like I knew something was wrong. I remember in elementary school, I was probably in about fourth grade, about noon to one o'clock. I'll never forget it. It's like I knew something was wrong. I was anxious, you know, and then on the way home, the closer I was getting home, the more I was feeling like overwhelmed. When I came in the house, I said, Snowflakes died, didn't she? And my mom was like, how did you know? No one told you. It was like I could see my dog but I couldn't touch her. I know as a child, I used to, my mother would call them imaginary friends, but they wasn't imaginary friends. They were to me very real. My mother lost both her parents before she was 21, her dad before she was 16, my gram- and her mother, my abuela, my grandmother, before she was even 20. You know, to me, I was playing with my grandmother. You know, I didn't know that she had passed away. I just thought, you know, this is kind of cool. I got my grandmother here, you know. Sometimes I didn't, I wasn't me. It was like something had taken over, you know, but it wasn't harmful. It was just, I can't explain it. It's like you're there, but you're not there. You know, as time went on, I was always a child that was on my own. You know, I didn't have a lot of friends. I had people call me weird or freak because things would happen around me. There was a time that we were in church and, you know, I would see things. Some of them was beautiful white. I mean, think of the most beautiful colors of a prism and amplify that like 10 times. And there were some times I would see something like dark shadow or something. And, you know, I just felt like sick whenever I seen it. I didn't know these things. You know, I didn't know about good and evil. You know, when you're a child, you only know what you're told or what you watch on TV or what your parents. I learned very quick that don't tell everybody what I can see because people don't always believe in those type of things. It was taboo back then. It's not talked about like it is now. I remember a time, it was like yesterday. I was a senior in high school. I had worked a graveyard shift. And I got to school early so I could do my homework because the night before I was working, I was working pretty much a full-time job and helping my parents out. So I got to school. Janitors, they were heading to the gym. I just sat down, just doing, started doing my homework. And I heard a rattle. I'm like, okay, maybe it's the janitors playing a joke on me because they got a keys to the room. I got up, stood up, looked in the, the, the door window. And the lights were off in the classroom. And the door was locked. I'm like, okay, I know I heard something. So I sat back down, started doing my homework again. And I heard it again. I looked up. The handle to the door was moving. And I just looked in there. So I'm like, okay, I'm tired. You know, I'm trying to rationalize it. And then it happened five minutes later again. But then the door across from me was moving And I knew that nobody was in there. I didn't see anybody go in there. So it was an increment of every five minutes and the door handles were moving. The one behind me, the one in front of me, and then it started going to every single door. I didn't know how to explain this feeling because it wasn't like it was a good feeling, but it wasn't bad. It was more like, hey, I'm here, you know, and I'll never forget that. I think between um, elementary and high school, I had a lot of encounters. If it wasn't having nightmares and seeing things or seeing something at night, you know, everybody's like, well, you probably had a nightmare or it was just your imagination. I've seen my mother, my sister have her, their accidents before that even happened. And it still haunts me today because... For so long, I blamed myself. I always asked myself, if I had told my mother about her accident at work, would I have stopped it? Or if I had listened and didn't um, ask my sister to take me to school, would she not have been in that wreck to begin with? And I have blamed myself for so long for that. 
I remember looking in books with pictures and not reading the words, just looking at these old pictures and just sometimes put my hands on those pictures. It was like I could hear what was going on. And then, you know, a day or so later, I decided to read the book because I looked at the pictures. Now let's read the book and everything that I saw, it was in the book, black and white to the T. I learned that I could see things through pictures. I have people today that will ask me to look at pictures. And a lot of times, depending on how strong the picture is, it radiates a lot of energy. You know, now I know what's going on. But back then, I didn't have anybody to talk to. I didn't have a preacher to confide in that would believe me. Again, back in the 80s, 90s, and early 2000s, a lot of this was taboo. I mean, it was just new. It was still being talked about. It was still there was a lot of people that were faking things or trying to get attention. I would say probably around 18, 19, I started actually having more encounters that were physical. I remember going to Shiloh Park as I got older and started jogging because I wanted to get to the military. I remember taking a break, you know, because when you jog for so long, you have to take a break because if not, you're going to pass out. But I remember I stopped in this one part of the woods. It was um, like an off-wood track or trail, I would say. When I was just standing there, I just felt like something was right behind me. And, you know, I just stopped. You know, I'm like, okay, why am I getting this feeling like I'm getting stared down? And something just pushed me. I'm like, are you serious? I'm from the South. You know, I didn't run like crazy run. Like, I got to get away. But I just continued my, my jog because I still felt like I was being watched. And lo and behold, I came across some of Yankees' uh, grave site. I'm like, seriously? <laughs> you know, I had to laugh because I guess they were still angry. You know, I mean, I've had spirits let me know why they're angry. One movie that I really connected with was The Sixth Sense. Because a lot of things, granted, Hollywood um, embellishes a lot of things. But that was a movie that made me feel better about myself because I could relate to it so much and not being heard. I remember a time we went to my mother's country and it had been a while since I've been there. For some reason, I just felt so comfortable. It's like I knew where I was at, you know, like I had lived there for a long time. And while I was there, got to see my grandmother and my grandfather. I got to hear them a lot better. While we were there, I had a handprint on my left um, upper shoulder. Not really the shoulder, but like in between like elbow and shoulder. Nobody could get that hand mark off my skin. They tried getting no polish remover, everything. It would not come off. Everybody was putting their hand on it to see if their hand would match. And it nobody hand would fit that print. It wasn't until I came back to the States and about two, three weeks later, the handprint just faded like it never was there. I wish I'd taken pictures of that. I mean, they tried everything. They tried nail polish remover. They tried alcohol. They tried lotion, you know, anything, and it would not come off. A lot of the things that I saw, like how my grandfather passed away and stuff like that. My mother never went to great details about it, but I was actually went to great details. I mean, bit for bit and everything. And my aunt told my mother, it's like, that's what their mother had told them. I had a uh, uncle that he was married to my aunt. So that's how he was my uncle. You know, he used to do tarot cards. And for some reason, every time I went around that area, it made me aggravated. Like I was angry. I didn't know why I was so angry. And now I realize that he wasn't doing it right. He was conning people in a way. It was making my grandparents mad that he was doing those things on the property that they worked hard on. I used to help people at work when they were trying to find um, inmates that were hiding things, stashing things, or um, shanks and stuff like that. And I would tell them, look at this pod around this, this location, and they would find shanks. I remember one instance I was a correctional guard. It was after two o'clock in the morning. And I remember seeing this baby. And I'm like, there's no baby on this prison. You know, this is an all male facility. 
And I seen this baby look directly at me and then walk through the wall. And I told my coworker, you know, I told him exactly what I seen. Well, a few weeks later, he went through with some files over there. And he told me there was a guy in there for murder. He killed the man that killed his child. So that was heartbreaking. You know, I don't like going where they're like to hospitals because, you know, I see the pain. I see the tears. And there's certain people I can't be around. I know during investigations and stuff like that, I've had people that they wanted me to do a walk of the property. And there's just sometimes people automatically think, oh, it's evil spirits. I'm like, no, you're invading their pro- their territory, offending them because you're doing thus, thus, and thus. And I told them what they could do to bring peace. Sometimes electronics act weird around me. Whenever we went on investigations, I could not be around the EMF or the, um, they had those toys that light up, it wouldn't work around me. But as soon as I left the area, the equipment and everything worked. My husband, he didn't have a lot of um, experiences. But when I got into the 18-wheeler with him, this is after I had my wreck and everything, he would have things happen in his truck that would normally not happen at all. He calls them gremlins, you know, so... He would say, Jackie, get your gremlins and give me back my stuff. And, you know, it's just, it's kind of funny. But yeah, I would say that in the next day or the next hour or two, whatever he was missing was found. I remember one time I was on the road and I was an extradition agent. We were in North Carolina. It was early in the morning. It was my shift to drive. I had to go inside, bathroom break clean up and get my coffee because I was half awake and half uh, still asleep. And I was in the bathroom getting freshened up and everything. And I hear like little kids laughing and I'm like, okay, I guess I didn't see any kids out in the lobby or anything like that. So I went out, paid for my stuff. And I said, did y'all have kids in here running around? He said, we haven't had kids all week. You would think I would be used to those things. Every experience is different. I know after my wreck, it was seems like my near death experience, it amplified it. I mean, just to think about some of the things I've seen within the last five years, it's overwhelming. I mean, going to Lowe's, I'm looking at a guy as solid as you and I, and then seeing them walk through the wall, it's like, okay, I'm, I'm going to go lay down now, kind of thing. I think the hardest thing personally is when I do investigations or when I did investigations would be seeing children because, you know, they're so innocent and they're so young, you know, they should have a full life. My last investigation I was on before I had my son, I went to a house and it was just so overwhelming. There was children spirits all over the place. I mean, there was just one little girl I'll never forget, blonde hair, you know, cute little girl. Then she became sickly looking and I'm like, okay, something happened. And then going inside, I just felt so much depression there. And I'm like, somebody committed suicide. And to find out that what I was seeing was accurate and the little girl, you know, I found out that area had a lot of yellow fever. It can be sad. You know, I think that's why I rather not do a lot of the readings like I used to, because I don't want to see the children, you know, when my son was born, we moved into this new house right before we had him, when he came into this world and everything. And then we had something in this house that was scaring my child, you know, and it, it's hard for me to say, like, I could see things outside this house. I could see things when I go like to public places or somebody else's home. In my own home, I couldn't see what was going on with my son. And all I could see was like, just feel like a darkness, you know, and it was scaring him. And then it mimics my husband and I. I was in the other room. My husband was supposed to be laying down. Our son was taking a nap and my son starts crying. I hear somebody tell my son to shut up and mama bear comes out and I went check in. It wasn't my husband. To know that something hated my son that bad and I could not see what was going on. That's the annoying part, I think, about this house. 
we've had so many things happen in this house that I would see a glimpse of things, but it would hide itself. And my son, who's possibly autistic, he smiles and waves at it. And I go to see what he's looking at and I don't see it. There was one time though, I thought my son was sitting on the bed and I'm over here at the computers and I turned and I was about to get on my son's case about, cause he's, he was climbing then he was just turning to, and I look over, my son's not on the bed. He's right in, in his side of the room. And I see the top of somebody's head walking through our bed. You know, it was that clear. And yet I couldn't see the exact, but I could see what it exactly what it wanted me to show. I meant see, you know, reveal itself. I've never had that experience before. Honestly, I think my son is gifted because there's things that happen around him that would spook anybody. I mean, my husband has been hearing the phone ring. We don't have a landline here. Our son could be taking a nap and his toys would go off all around him. I could be by myself here in the house and I would hear the door shutting and there's no reason for that door to shut. We'll go out and the doors wasn't even moved. Uh, my husband's been locked out of the house. I've had the door open on me and closed. It's kind of irritating because it won't show itself. And that's the annoying part because we've tried a house blessing. We did a house blessing about a little over two years ago and the cross from the oil is still there. It's like I just did the blessing yesterday. I'm used to it now. There are some things that do take me by surprise. I've had somebody, you know, that did not like me. And I told them exactly what they thought about me. And they turned white as a ghost. I'm not even kidding. You know, I called people out on things that I shouldn't know. And it's not like I can hear your thoughts. I hear whatever is being told to me. And there's a lot of times that I accept my gift, but... There's a time that I used to think that it was a curse because it made me an outsider. I remember a few months ago, I finally got to tell my mother what her mother told me to tell her. It took me over, uh, let's say I'm 38, so over 30 years to tell my mother a message from her mom. To see my mom cry, it, it hurt, but I think it gave my mother peace. Because she's always been the one to tell me not to say anything, you know, ignore it, you know, try not to use it. You know, it's hard to turn something off that once it's turned on, you know, it's like, I know that there's people that they want to make a profit over it or they use their gifts the wrong way. There was a time that I did try to use tarot cards and stuff like that. And it went horribly wrong, especially when I, when I was first married, it got to a point where my first husband actually hated me because I was able to tell him exactly what he was doing and up to. And we finally, our marriage, you know, ended. You know, for a while after I had my accident, it was like silence, you know. And then when I was getting better, it was like giving me a new chance at life and stuff like that. So, you know, I try to help people now. I try to, you know, if there's something wrong, listen. Back in 2012 was when I had my wreck. That's when I, you know, I should have known that I shouldn't have went on that trip. I went on it because I was separated from my first husband. You know, I needed extra money. So I decided to take the trip. After this trip, I was going to be, be a corporal and I was going to run my own team. You know, it was my dream to have my own team anyways. And the night before... I remember coming inside the house and if you ever go hunting, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. You know, something's there. You don't know what it is, but you know that you're, you know, it's something there. I was on the uh, first step and I had something that resembled a lizard. To explain it, it would be like something that was almost like in a scary movie. You know, it didn't seem real. I was not drinking that day. And I wasn't doing any drugs. It took me a minute. I'll never forget the color eyes. It was yellow eyes. And then I'm, I'm like, okay, 
I'm okay. Nothing's going to bother. You know, it's just, I'm, I'm probably tired, you know? And then when I went on that trip, you know, it was like little things were happening. I'm like, I should turn around, but I'm already committed on this trip. And I'll never forget it. I was, we were just in Colorado. We were heading to California. It was after midnight. I know that I was working the great dark shift. I was driving. I saw this deer and I'm talking about like Bambi's mother. I'm talking about a good sized deer, but something was right about the deer. I'm like, okay, deer is like not moving. I can't, it's snowing and icing, you know, I'm bracing myself for impact. But right before the vehicle even came close to it, it looked up and looked at me and the face on this deer was so messed up. It was like looking at that lizard only it wasn't a lizard. It was a deer, but it wasn't a deer. So about a mile or two up the road, I pulled over. I went and got me some coffee and just tried to shake it off. And back then I was smoking. So I did have a smoke, you know, just to calm down because what I saw, I couldn't explain it. I just know that the face just stays with you. When you see something like that, it stays with you. Just talking about it brings you back to that place. So we went through um, California. We were heading back again through Colorado, go back home. I wasn't driving. And my sergeant hits a mule deer about 80, 85 miles per hour. And I am thrown. I'm the only one to get injured in that wreck. And that ended my career. I started getting to demonology thereafter because I wanted to find out what I saw. I wanted to get to the bottom of things because I knew what I saw wasn't something I've ever encountered before. When I started to do more research, I was inside. There was no AC on. There was no fan on. And my paper, my Bible, it was like something was breathing, like a wind in, inside the house. So I had to get outside. I had to take a deep breath. And later that night, I had my very first seizure. I never had a seizure before. And they didn't understand what was causing it. You know, I studied demonology and everything. And I understand now what happened. I'm not going to go too much into it because I don't want to. It's just I'm afraid sometimes that people, they don't know what door they're opening. And when you open that door, you never know what's on the other side. So. There's some people that will look up these things and they could actually invite those things into, into their lives. So when you study demonology, you pretty much need strong faith. I'll put it that way, because you can actually invite something in your home. And that's what happened. I wasn't prepared. I wasn't in the right mindset to look this demons up. That's what caused my seizure. That's what caused the win. It's just a lot to take in because I've been around these things almost all my life. And, you know, I understand now what happened. I understand why things I saw, you know, it's like the man that used to walk up and down, up and down in the attic. Certain other things that happened, like, you know, electricity around me was messed up. I found out years later that the man that had built my parents' house was killed by electricity. So now I understand why I heard the uh, footsteps. He was letting me know that he was still around. You know, even in our old house in Morris Chapel, I can remember going on live on, my, on Facebook and I look out towards the woods where there's nobody there. And I see this big orange, like an amber color uh, orb. You know, there's no light sources. And because it's in the woods, if somebody was out there, I would hear like the snapping of limbs, you know, some uh, human or a deer or animals like that make noises. And there was nothing that night. And the next day where I saw the orb, there was like so many fallen branches, so many things to make noise. And yet it didn't register on the face on Facebook live camera. I tried taking pictures of it and it did not show anything on my phone or anything. And to this day, I still cannot reenact that. You know, there's no way for me to what caused that, you know. So I believe that we live in a physical world and I believe that we live in a, a supernatural world. 
that's that's pretty much it, I think, for right now. And those were just a few of my um, paranormal experiences. If you've had a paranormal experience and would like to be a guest on the show, please contact us by going to myparax.com. That's my para e x dot com. Thanks for listening.